Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next eh, roughly half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at several things that I think are important for you to notice, important for you to know about, and maybe even do something about. Uh, as always, I always invite comments, questions, reactions to the show. You can contact me directly at my email. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you're very nice, I'll even tell you what the name means. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. And uh, you can get the email address in there. Or you can leave a comment there, if you'd rather. If you do email me, please, as always, include something in the subject line to make it clear that it's not spam and be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm a little slow about email. But I do answer. You will get an answer. All right, we're going to start, as I always like to start, whenever I can try to do this every week, start with some bit of good news. And we've got two of them this week, actually. The first being that the state of Vermont has enacted a bill that will raise the state's minimum wage to $10.50 an hour uh, by 2018. That would be the highest state-level minimum wage in the country. Now, it's not, still not enough. It's less than $22,000 a year for somebody working full-time year-round, but at least it's a clear improvement. Seven states this year have passed laws raising their state minimum wages, including Connecticut, Hawaii, and Maryland, all of which voted to raise them to $10.10 an hour uh, over the next couple of years. The District of Columbia has also raised its minimum wage to, that's to $11.50 an hour by 2018, uh, 2016, rather. And uh, several U.S. cities have also raised their minimum wage this year. For example, Seattle just voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour over the next several years, uh, which uh, at least is enough to keep a family out of poverty. Meanwhile, the federal minimum wage remains at a paltry $7.25 an hour. Now, the other bit of good news on a, is on another front. As I said last week was expected, Wisconsin's ban on same-sex marriage has been struck down as unconstitutional. It is the 14th consecutive failure by the bigots to maintain legal approval of their bigotry. U.S. District Judge Barbara Crabb said that her review of the law, quoting her, convinces me that plaintiffs are entitled to the same treatment as any heterosexual couple, and so I conclude that the Wisconsin laws banning marriage between same-sex couples are unconstitutional. Now, she actually created some confusion in her ruling because she struck down the law, but she did not immediately issue an order blocking its enforcement. But neither at the same time did she issue a stay of her decision, saying that she wouldn't act on the request for a stay until after the American Civil Liberties Union, which had filed the suit on behalf of eight couples, uh, tells her exactly what it is in the law they want her to block. So there is some confusion among county clerks as to whether or not they should immediately start going ahead and issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. But it does appear that within a couple of days, most of them uh, decided that, yeah, they were going to go ahead and do it. So same-sex marriage has come to Wisconsin. You know, and it seems to me, it seems to me that every one of these pro-marriage justice decisions that have come down recently has some memorable line in it, some memorable moment. I actually love this bit from Judge Crabb, uh, where she smacked down the argument that, well, it's traditional. As an initial matter, it's quoting her again, as an initial matter, defendants and amici have overstated their argument. Throughout history, the most traditional form of marriage has not been between one man and one woman, but between one man and multiple women, which presumably is not a tradition that defendants and amici would like to continue. Slammer. All right, moving on to something else. Uh, we've got a very brief update of something I mentioned recently uh, about having freedom of but not freedom from religion. You know, I keep, I keep not intending to discuss this topic. As I say, it's not high on my personal list, but things keep cropping up. And you know, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in again. Tamar Courtney and Morgan Strong planned on, uh, planned on getting married after six years together. Uh, 
They'd hoped a friend would be able to officiate, but that friend had trouble getting his license to do it. So the couple turned to the officials of Franklin County, Virginia. A judge there referred them to two court-appointed officiants. The first official they called, Bud Roth, asked Courtney about her religious denomination. She said she's an agnostic and strong as an atheist. Upon which, Roth flatly refused to marry them. He told her the couple didn't have the right to get married because they didn't know where God was. When he heard about this, uh, Strong was so incredulous that he called Roth himself and recorded the call. When Strong asked why he won't marry them, Roth says flat out, quoting, because she's agnostic and you're an atheist. I will not marry you. You don't believe in God. Now, the other officiant did agree to marry them, but the idea that a court-appointed official could impose a religious litmus test on the right to get married shows how far we actually are from that absolute church-state separation that the right wing is always whining about. From there, we go on to one of our regular weekly features. This is the Outrage of the Week. And this week, it's going to be short, but naturally not sweet. And it's actually not a new event. Rather, it's an ongoing festering wound on our national conscience. But I was reminded of it this last week, and so I decided to bring it up. And this all started with my stumbling across an article that turned out to be from last fall, November to be exact, stating that the city of Los Angeles was considering passing an ordinance that would make it illegal to feed homeless people in a public place. Now, the Greater West End Food Coalition has been feeding the homeless in the Los Angeles area for 27 years. But as homelessness got worse in Los Angeles County, even has actually declined uh, most other places, the city wanted the group to just go away and not disturb the local homeowners who didn't want to have to see all these icky homeless people around. Now, I was unable to find out if this bill actually passed or not, but I would not be the least bit surprised if it did, because in recent years, dozens of U.S. cities have passed such laws. Philadelphia, Denver, Ashland, Oregon, Atlanta, Phoenix, San Diego, Miami, Oklahoma City, Orlando, Dallas, dozens more, more than 50 cities in all have passed laws to make it illegal to feed homeless people. The bans have been challenged, sometimes successfully, but sometimes it seems like trying to kill the Hydra. And the excuses for why cities do this sometimes border on the absurd. Birmingham, Alabama said that it was to protect the homeless from tainted food. Philadelphia claimed that banning feeding the homeless in public was actually a matter of expanding, uh, expanding programs for the homeless. And New York City actually went further than most. It actually outlawed food donations to homeless shelters because, get this now, the city cannot address the salt, fat, and fiber content of those donations. And apparently for the homeless to have no food at all is preferable to them having food with too much salt. That absurdity, that, that kind of absurdity of these excuses only serves up to point up the real reason for these bans. Despite all the talk about wanting to help the homeless, it remains just that. Talk. And while it's true that the number of homeless people has declined in recent years, in fact, it dropped about 16% between uh, 2010 and 2013, that still means that on any given night, about 600,000 people in this country have nowhere to be. And the idea that it could be, and in many places is, a crime to feed those people because we just don't want to have to see them, that is an outrage. And before we go to break, one other thing. Uh, it's our other regular weekly feature. This is the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. The winner of the Big Red Nose this week is the man who puts the PU in pundit. The man who became the go-to intellectual for the right wing by proving that you can be polysyllabic and still be a complete moron. His name is George Will. 
In a syndicated column on June 6th, George Will addressed what he called, quoting, the supposed campus epidemic of rape, a.k.a. sexual assault. Oh no, it's not sexual assault, a term he more than once in the course of this slide put in quotation marks, it's sexual assault. Uh, no, it's not sexual assault, it's, and I'm quoting him now, it's the ambiguities of the hookup culture, this cocktail of hormones, alcohol, and the faux sophistication of today's prolonged adolescence of especially privileged young adults. So the problem isn't sexual assault. Oh, no, no, no. The problem is all the ambiguities involved. Apparently, a man taking advantage of a woman too drunk to know what's going on isn't actually sure of what it is he's doing. I mean, it's all just, it's so ambiguous, you know? How is he supposed to tell if he's sexually assaulting her or not? How is he supposed to tell if he's raping her or not? It's just, how, how is he supposed to know? That's the real problem, according to Will. Not sexual assault, no. It's that colleges are not recognizing the ambiguities of the hookup culture. Instead, instead of this, they are letting, as the theme from Jaws rises in the background, they are letting, he says, progressivism run roughshod over their administrative policies. And here is where it gets really disgusting, because Will argues that the result of that progressivism is that, quoting again, campuses make victimhood a coveted status that confers privileges. That's right, George Will says that these days being the victim of sexual assault is a coveted status at colleges and universities, one complete with privileges. That's why the number of sexual assaults reported on campuses went up by 50% from 2001 to 2011, from 2,200 cases to 3,300 cases. All of those women, they just wanted to get in on the goodies. Now, I will say that personally, personally, I have to disagree with those who say that there is an epidemic, a term I've seen used several places, an epidemic of sexual assault on campus, because that implies there's a lot more now than there used to be. And I believe, rather, that there has always been a problem of sexual assault on campus, but in recent times, women have finally just gotten sick and tired of being expected to put up with it, to put up with the grabbing and the groping, and to keep silent about the brutalizing attacks. But that is what, exactly what George Will does expect. George Will expects women to continue to put up with the routine violations, the affronts, the assaults, the humiliations. Now, he truly protests that he means no such thing. Oh, he doesn't condone rape. Of course not. But in fact, he does condone it. He condones it by trivializing it and trivializing the issue as just the ambiguities of the hookup culture. Now, on top of everything else, his argument is not only callous, it is dishonest. He tells the story of a student at Swarthmore College who had, this is just last year, this is in 2013. Uh, this student got into bed with an ex-boyfriend because he fell asleep on her bed in her dorm room. And after a while, he woke up and started trying to undress her. She told him no, he'd stop for a while, they'd go back to it, until finally she said just wanted to be able to go to sleep. She just kind of lay there and let him do it. Um, that was just to get it over with. And later on, she reported that she'd been raped. Now, Will found that absurd, mocking that, quoting him, now the Obama administration is writing to the rescue of sexual assault victims. Well, first off, that was sexual assault, not sexual assault. But the point here is that the very next part of the story that he was quoting the very next part tells how the, sc the school counselor to who she went refused to believe her. He told her that the male student was such a good guy that she had to be mistaken. The purpose of the original story, the one of which Will quoted only the part he thought he could mock, the purpose of the story was the difficulty women have and have had in, in reporting sexual assaults to administrators who are either callous or incompetent or indifferent or who more often are more interested in protecting the image of the school than in justice or even simple human decency. So to sum it all up, George Will is callous, ignorant, and dishonest. 
locked into a past that never actually existed because he can't deal with the present. In other words, he's a true right-winger. Now, George, you may be able to string together phrases like excavate equities from the ambiguities of the hookup culture, but that doesn't change the fact that, George Will, you are a complete and total clown. And we are taking a break. And here we are back again. Okay, so another day, another school shooting. This one took place in Troutdale, Oregon, a town in the Columbia River Basin, um, east of Portland. A teenager armed with a rifle went into Reynolds High School and opened fire. He killed a student and wounded a teacher before going into a bathroom and apparently killing himself. It was just the latest in an ever-lengthening string of shootings at schools across the country. It was, in fact, the 74th school shooting since Adam Lanza shot down students and teachers at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, this map shows you where these school shootings have taken place. I'm not sure if you can actually, so you can see they're scattered across the country. I'm not sure you can actually tell the colors, but if you can, the red markers uh, were schools that are K through 12, and the purple markers were colleges and universities. Now, just to be clear, not every one of these incidents involves someone being killed or wounded, uh, but they did involve guns being fired, not just carried, but fired in schools or on campus. Despite the fact that um, gun homicide death has, has declined substantially over the past two decades, along with most other kinds of crime, about 11,000 Americans are still murdered every year by guns, and another 19,000 kill themselves with guns. That is a much higher rate than anywhere else in the developed world. And why? What can we do about it? Well, if the shills for the gun industry at the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, or the NRA, continue to have their way, the answers to those questions will be, who knows? For years, the Centers, of, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, whose mandate is to research uh, uh, cause and prevention of threats to public health, which gun violence certainly is, has been pushed away from doing research that is advocacy for gun control. And of course, any research that shows a connection between guns and gun violence, which any research on the topic would, would be considered advocacy for gun control. So in other words, they basically can't research it at all. In fact, the very idea of research is, is anathema to the Congressional Lobby for Murder Incorporated. A proposal to renew funds for the CDC to do research on gun violence is, according to one bought-off congressman, quoting, funding propaganda for Obama's gun-grabbing initiatives, which uh, echoed the NRA's stand of having called the same bill an unethical abuse of taxpayer funds for anti-gun political propaganda. Which tells me, as it tells anybody that has two synapses to rub together, that they don't want the research done because they know what it will say. They know that they are in the wrong. They know that their drive for profit and perks is causing thousands of deaths a year, and they don't care. And what do we do about it? Well, on the whole, we as people do nothing at all. We as a people, for the most part, have given up on this. There's been so much blood, so much grief, that we have gone through denial, anger, and bargaining, and are now deep in depression, just one step for, short of the final stage of acceptance. In fact, the satirical newspaper, The Onion, uh, summed it up quite nicely. In the wake of the Isla Vista shootings a couple of weeks ago, The Onion headlined its coverage with this. No way to prevent this, says only nation where this regularly happens. 
quoted the article, this was a terrible tragedy, but sometimes these things just happen and there's nothing anyone can do to stop them, said North Carolina resident Samuel Whipper, echoing sentiments expressed by tens of millions of individuals who reside in a nation where over half of the world's deadliest mass shootings have occurred in the past 50 years and whose citizens are 20 times more likely to die of gun violence than those of other developed nations. It's a shame, but what can we do, Mr. Whipper said. As is too often the case, it is the comedians and the satirists, not the media, who say what it is that needs to be said. Still, as I said two weeks ago, not everyone has given up. I mentioned a couple of examples then, to which can be added a new effort by some members of the California State Legislature to expand the ability of families and relatives of those who are showing violent tendencies to obtain uh, intervention to keep that person from owning guns. And by the way, related to that, very quickly related to that, uh, I have to tell you, one of the things that drives me the, the, drives me crazy more than, uh, more than other things in this whole thing is the argument that we can't have gun control because that would impede the rights of law-abiding citizens. So let me remind you, until he opened the f open fire that night in that theater in Aurora, Colorado, James Holmes was a law-abiding citizen. Every bit of the armory of weapons he had, he got legally. Until the moment he fired the first shot at Virginia Tech, Sung Hee Cho was a law-abiding citizen. Until he killed his mother before heading to Sandy Hook Elementary, Adam Lanza was a law-abiding citizen. And I expect we'll learn that the shooter at Troutdale was, until the moment the first body hit the floor, a law-abiding citizen. So don't even try that argument on me. But anyway, getting back to the hopeful part. Uh, one last thing for now is that it's apparently possible it develops for the drooling gun nuts who apparently think even NRA President Wayne La Pipi Le Pew uh, is too soft on the issue. Uh, it's possible for those folks to go too far. An outfit of wackos called Open Carry Texas has been going around into stores and restaurants wearing their manhood slung over their shoulder instead of in their pants. The result has been that Starbucks, Wendy's, Applebee's, Jack in the Box, Chipotle, Chili's, and Sonic have all announced policies of saying, please keep your damn guns out. In a video about this by, by Open Carry Texas, after being refused service at a Sonic, one of this overcompensating crowd griped that nobody likes us. To which I could only say, good, and I can hope for more of the same. All right, last thing for today. Last thing. We have an RIP this week. Now, you may have heard about this. It actually got a fair amount of coverage, but just in case you didn't, or even if you did, it's still an interesting thing, interesting enough to note. Uh, it revolves around one of the lesser-known stories. It's better known now than it used to be, but it's still one of the lesser-known stories of World War II. The man's name was Chester Nez. He died of kidney failure on June 4th. He was 93. Chester Nez was born at Cousin Brothers Trading Post on the Navajo Nation about 15 miles southwest of Gallup, New Mexico. The official date for his birth was January 23rd, 1921, but his family says they actually aren't sure of the actual date. Um, he grew up at uh, Chichilata, which uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing correctly and means among the oaks, until at the age of nine he was sent to boarding school, as a lot of native children were, where the government was going to teach these native children how to be white. He was required, for example, to learn English and to speak only English. He was punished, uh, for example, by having his mouth washed out with soap if he was caught speaking his native tongue. In 1942, in response to military recruiters who came to the school, he enlisted in the Marine Corps, and this is where it gets interesting. Chester Nez was the last survivor of the original group of Code Talkers. The Code Talkers were Navajos recruited by the U.S. military in World War II with the idea that they could create an essentially unbreakable military code. You see, very few non-Navajos spoke or speak Navajo. And it was a pretty safe bet that none of those very few people were in the Japanese military. What's more, the Navajo language had no written form. 
So Nez and 28 other Navajo were set the task of developing a code based on their native tongue. It took them 13 weeks to do this, but they came up with a, with a basic initial glossary of over 200 terms in the Navajo language, um, as well as developing an alphabet to be used with it. Each code talker memorized this code, which involved assigning letters to terms in the Navajo language and then substituting Navajo words for common military terms. So, for example, a submarine was an iron fish, a tank was a tortoise, a grenade was a potato, that kind of thing. These men then went into combat with the Marines, uh, assigned to different units, communicating in their code via the radios. Now, the Japanese had proved themselves to be skilled code breakers, but this code was never broken. Because, after all, how do you break a code spoken in a language probably nobody in your country speaks and which you don't even have a way to write down? Now, this wasn't the first use of Native Americans as code talkers. Apparently, the practice began in World War I when some Cherokees and Choctaws uh, did this. Nor are Navajos the only Native Americans so used by the military in World War II. Lakota, Meskwaki, Comanche soldiers, in fact, including the Navajo in all, 16 different Native American peoples uh, contributed their language skills. Nez was proud of what he did in the war, which is a bit ironic considering that the time that he enlisted, Navajos couldn't even vote in this country. But for a long time he couldn't tell anyone what he had done because, with the usual grace with which, with which the government uh, reveals its secrets, the program was not declassified until 1968, as if in the 1950s knowing this happened would be a terrible threat to national security, which is especially silly because people did already know about it. In fact, there was a movement from 1959 called Never So Few, which included a Navajo code talker as a character. But nevertheless, what I have always found most fascinating about this story, beyond an ever-enduring image of the Jap a movie image of the of Japanese soldiers listening to the code talkers on the radio and scratching their heads in utter bewilderment, what it tells us something about is about the variety and complexity of human language and the cultural importance of preserving the rapidly declining variety of language that this planet is experiencing. So. Chester Nez, last of the original World War II code talkers, know that what you did was more than about winning a war. It was about the idea of cultural survival, about preserving and celebrating cultural complexity and cultural diversity. So, R.I.P. Chester Nez. Uh, that's going to be it for this week. So I just wanted to wish you uh, to have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week again. Feel free to contact me with any responses, but for the moment, again, have the best week you possibly can, and peace. <laughs>